Hi, I'm Steve Bellamy, and with winter approaching, I wanted to give the new handlers in our region some things to think about over the winter uh, that they could be working on at home to make their time at the club in the spring much more productive, uh, whether it's in obedience or protection. Uh, many times when you go to clubs, you see, whether it's obedience or, or protection, you see dogs that when they're recalled, uh, they don't come the first time if they're holding the toy or the sleeve, or if you ask them to drop the toy or sleeve, they don't respond. And, and again, keep in mind, in a trial, it's the first command that counts, and so we want to work on that. So these are a few tips that I've picked up over the years from different people that you can work on in your own home uh, without the added distractions of the club or the increased drive of trying to teach these skills and protection work. And in the spring, hopefully it'll make your time with your club and your helpers much more productive. So the first game I want to talk about a little bit is uh, what I learned from Bernard Flinks back in the 1990s. I call it the three option game. I don't quite recall what he uses it, but there may be videos on YouTube that show clips of it, or Liebert did a se uh, series years ago with Bernard, and there may be uh, some free video or even old tapes on, on his website. Um, but basically, the reason I like the game is it, it was developed to really have dogs maintain a strong, calm grip when they come back to you. Um, but it also has some added benefits. I mean, one is it helps really increase the trust level between you and your dog, uh, and that trust level helps with conflict-free outs. So you're working on multiple things in this game. Uh, I typically start with a 15-foot leash and a, and a toy, um, usually a ball with a string or, or a tug. Um, when the dogs are older, I fade the leash, but for when I start out, how we keep the dog on the 15-foot leash when you're learning it. A, you have more control, and again, it also simulates when you get to in front of a helper and a sleeve, uh, the dog will be on a leash and it'll have that pattern of coming back to you. Um, when you do this, there's really three things you're working on at the same time. You're balancing them, you're reading the dog. Um, the first is just simply coming back to you, maintaining that toy with a nice, strong grip. Um, and if it comes back, fast. Sometimes I release it right away or what I call kind of a touch and go. It comes in, nice grip, boom, free, you're gone, circle around. The other thing that I work into there is uh, playing. So if the dog comes back, I'll grab the string uh, while the dog's in my arms and uh, if it's made, you know, I, I pull it and if it's maintaining a great grip, okay, we play a little tug, I release the dog to come around again. If the dog loses it because it didn't maintain a good grip, well then it has to work a little bit longer to get the toy and builds drive for that toy. Um, and the third option is uh, an out. And again, the dog comes back. I say, when I have the dog come back, I say in my arms. It's kind of a little bit more casual command than let's say here because that's a formal position in front for me. So I say in my arms, the dog comes back and I ask the dog to out. Uh, the faster it outs, the faster it gets its toy again. Later on, it'll out and I'll make it maintain kind of the drive without re-engaging, but early on, the faster it outs, the faster it gets its toy again. And there's really three levels of difficulty um, with the out. Um, with it, I, when I'm starting out, I'll tell the dog to out, drops it to the ground, gets it again. The second one would be me holding the toy, let's say by the string with a little bit of back pressure, uh, ask it to out, if it outs, gets to bite it again. And the third for more advanced dogs would be actually really pulling on the uh, tug or the ball and asking it to out, which is again a lot harder for the dog to do because it's fighting, it's engaged, but it does have great carryover down the road for protection work. Um, I guess another thing to keep in mind, I, when I say, typically when I say in my arms, I have the dog come right up in front of me kind of sideways and I cradle it that way. But a ask your helper what they prefer. I mean, some people would say, I would, would say in your arms, and the dog would come basically in the basic position, sitting next to you, uh, and, and you could hold its head just like you might with the sleeve, and again, you maintain the pressure on the ball. Um, some other people I've seen say transport. The dog comes around, stands up in the transport position. Again, you're maintaining the pressure uh, just like you would uh, whether it was sitting or whether it was in front of you. Uh, it's just whatever works best for your training program, whatever your long-term goals are. I think it's also important to keep in mind, it, you know, remember it's your toy, you give the dog permission when to bite it, when not to bite it, um, but it can't be so, to keep the dog engaged, it can't be so one-sided that 
every time it comes back, it loses the toy because it's going to be like, well, why do I want to come back? Why do I want to out? So again, keeping that balance, reading the dog, uh, you know, if it outs fast, it gets it. If, if it has a weaker grip, maybe you work grips a little bit more than, than the out, so you, you can kind of play back and forth. Um, I, I think of it a little bit like in basketball. At home, you have you know, your basic drills, your dribbling drills, your layups, your drop step drills so that when you get to practice or when you're in competitions, you don't even think about those things. It's the same thing with these basic skills. You know, coming to you, outing on command, uh, maintaining the grip, those are all basic skills that you can work with the dog that when you get to club, your time will be used so much more efficiently and you won't be wasting your energy, your dog's energy, on a hot day with things that could have been cleaned up at home. You're getting to work on steps that help you progress as quickly as possible towards your goal or proof your dog even better. So we're going to do demonstrate the Bernard Flink's three options with free or touch and goes, out, and just plain. Uh, I do it on leash, which transfers over to protection for a young dogs, but when they're older, typically I don't have the leash on. Free. Left. That's my command in my arms. So again, one just sideways but ask your helper what they like the other could be in my arms, in my arms. Sit. but here again they got to maintain the grip if they let go they lose it Good. Free. in my arms transport oh Come on. transport house transport drop Free. In my arms. So the first again is just touch and go. Free. In my arms. Free. That's touch and go. That's the first. In my arms. Free. The second will be to maintain the grip. Fight. In my arms. So I usually grab it here. Now if you let go, he would have lost it. We're just trying to keep a nice, calm grip. Free. Get my arm. Go again. If you can steal it, steal it. Then they just have to work for it again. Get my arm. Drop. Free. So on the outer drop, the faster they drop it, the faster they get it back. And there's really three levels of difficulty. One is the easiest, you just saw, drop it on the ground. Come on, in my arm. The next would be drop. Just right there. Free. And the third would be with some back pressure. Come on. In my arm. Drop. Free. Okay, so now we'll mix them up. Come on. In my arm. Drop. Free. Free. Again, all you're trying to do is nice calm grip which transfers over to helper work and then coming back to you on one command. In my arms. So the second game I wanted to talk a little bit about is Ivan Balabanov's possession game, or at least my interpretation of it. Uh, I'd refer you, to, refer you to the Train Purview website or his books for more information. Probably the website would have his most up-to-date uh, thoughts because they're always evolving and it's much easier to update the website. Um, but check it out. But in, in, overall, it works on many of the same things we're working on with the Bernard Flint technique. It works on engagement. It works on... Uh, calm outs, uh, but again, outs are not bad. Outs are breaks in the action, a chance to re-engage with the helper or the, or the handler. Uh, it works on letting the dog know that you know, body contact is fun. You know, rough play is fun with the helper as well as with the handler. Uh, that it's okay to be rough uh, in the right situations. I think the biggest difference I've picked up uh, 
or the interpretations I think is that Ivan's a little bit less concerned with, and I know some other uh, trainers are as well, with what the dog does with the toy when it's released, when it's not engaged with the helper or the handler. Um, so sometimes that leads to the question, well, if that's the case, will the dog bunch the sleeve more protection work, uh, be a little bit more, have more movement or uh, on the sleeve? And I think you know, part of it depends on the dog. That's why I think Flint's technique may be great for certain dogs, and Ivan's may be better for others. Uh, so read the dog, figure out what you might need. Um, but what I've seen, and I'll show you a, a quick, quick clip of a Malinois later, that you know, while engaged, while fighting, the grips are super strong, super calm, um, you know, no shifting going on. But again, when he has the toy on his own, he can do what he wants, he flips it around. But the second he comes back, he clamps down even harder uh, in order to play. So I think that's the biggest difference, difference in philosophy. That's why some people like the one game versus the other. But I think I just wanted to make sure people know both. Read your dog, figure out what works best in your club environment, um, and go from there. So we'll do Ivan's a little bit here. Again, check out his video and books, but uh, it's a little bit less concerned. The first one is definitely, if you're working grips with a dog that doesn't have great grips, the flinks method works great. If you have a strong biter, uh, a lot of times in the Ivan method, you don't care what the dog does with it after the, the, you release it, um, as long as it's strong when you're fighting it in the grip. So, drop it. The big thing here, again, is engagement. And then you can work your outs just the same as you would in the other method. Fight. So I can work quiet out. Out. Freak. <laughs> Drop. that at home too. So when you get back to the training field, whether you're doing quiet or active, you at least get some reps in. Fight. Ows. Back up. Free. Ows. Back up. Yeah. Possession games, Ivan again works that into um, obedience, whether it's possession game to healing, back to possession games, or um, asking for other skills, other high drive skills uh, with respect to sits, downs, you know, just. It's just, as long as he outs, he gets to do something else, or he gets it right back right away. Drop. Free. Drop. Free. But again, the three things. Again, if I'm not holding it, it's easier. If I'm holding it, it's a lot harder. But it's good practice for when you get with a helper, because it's going to be a lot more difficult there. Out. Oh, good. Easy. Easy. Sit. Yeah, bud. Drop it. Uh, you know, overall, I hope seeing some quick clips of these two different games has given you some ideas, things to work on at home, things to experiment with. Uh, you know, I always encourage experimenting as long as, you know, if you're experimenting with drive, with fun, uh, you can experiment. I mean, if you're doing it with pressure, that's a different story. You've got to be careful what you do there. But, uh, you know, in this case, these games are very uh, fun, engaging, and the most important thing is have fun out on the trial field. See you in the spring.